Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Mercedes with Rocky Nook. Today we have a very exciting webinar from Iberian X Pirello. Iberian X is a photographer, a writer, educator, and host of the Candid Frame Photography Podcast. He has over 25 years of experience in the photographic industry. In his role as host and producer of the Candid Frame, he conducts frank, insightful interviews with some of the industry's top established and emerging photographers. Barian X is also the author or co-author of six books, including Chasing the Light, Improving Your Photography Using Available Light, and Adobe Masterclass Photoshop. His photographs and articles have appeared in numerous publications and websites. He is an adjunct professor at the Art Center College of Design, as well as an instructor at the Better Photo Online Photography School. Currently, he lives in Los Angeles, and today he is here to talk with us about setting the stage for your photography. Before he does that, I just want to mention that for everyone who is here in the webinar, we are offering a Barry and X's book, Making Photographs, which I have right here, at a 40% off discount. We will show you the information for that in the chat uh, in a few minutes. And then also, that information was in your uh, RSVP email, and it will be in an email you receive tomorrow, which includes a replay of the webinar. So if you miss anything today, or if you want to go back and watch again, Tomorrow, you will get sent a link to watch the replay, which you can watch at your convenience at any time. I also want to mention that Barionix will be taking questions at the end of this webinar, so feel free to submit your questions at any time, uh, and we will come back to those questions at the end, and Barionix will answer those. So you're not here to see me. You're here to see Barionix, so I will turn it over to him now. Good morning, Barionix. How are you? <laughs> Always a hiccup with technology. Well. Welcome everyone. Oh. Uh, thanks for joining me this uh, this morning or this afternoon or this evening, wherever you are. Um, what I want to talk to you today about is the uh, the concept of uh, finding the setting. Um, I talk a lot of, about my book in my book about the idea of how to look at a scene, looking at light and shadow, line and shape, color and gesture, and how to use those elements in order to become more conscious of how to compose a, a frame. But another part of that book is is about using those those visual elements to help draw you into a scene and how you can start sort of parsing it. And when we first start shooting photographs, we tend to see a subject, we gravitate to the subject, we raise the camera to our eye and we make make the photograph. And we're thinking so much about the subject that we're not really considering everything else that's in the frame. You know, so you'd have the proverbial tree growing out of someone's head because you didn't see that tree positioned four or five feet behind the, the subject, which ruins the shot. And it could be anything. It doesn't have to be a tree. It could be, you know, a red car on the right hand side or someone in a white t-shirt on the left. So it's really important to start, to start thinking about exactly what's in that composition, because beyond the subject, everything else that's in that frame is going to inform the success of the failure of the shot. I'm going to use some images to sort of illustrate the point. I'm going to talk about it primarily by coming into a scene or a moment and not necessarily being drawn into because of a singular subject. Rather, I'm going to talk about coming into a scene because it looks like it might be a good stage for a photograph. And even though the subject or the moment hasn't presented itself, it's a way of taking a look at the world in a way where you can get a sense that uh, a particular place has potential to make for an interesting photograph. So rather than me blabbing away, let me uh, share my screen in a moment. You'll get that uh, perpetual thing where it goes. Oh, okay. All right. Let me see. Hopefully you'll see my screen. Green in a second. Oh, there, now we got it. Okay. Can you hear me? We can hear you and we can see your screen. So this time is going much better. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much. Sorry for, sorry for the hiccup there. All right. So let's just jump into it. So part of what I like to do is is this idea of, of seeing a scene and observing the potential for it. Now, for example, here I 
I photographed these two people walking across the street. And for me, I was at the street corner. I saw the quality of light. I saw the curb. I saw the hydrant. And I saw that they were about to walk across the street. Now, the colors between the woman's coat, the blue of his shirt, the yellow uh, fire hydrant, they all held interest for me. But as they were standing there about to cross the street, I really had to think about what my, what my composition was. So I framed the shot even before they began walking. They were just standing there. I knew that as soon as the light changed that I would get an interesting gesture as they, as they stepped off the curb. So during that, that those few 10 or 20 seconds that I had, I really carefully looked at what did I want to include in the, in the scene. Had I just been focused on the woman in her red coat, I could have included a bunch of distracting elements, including a car, you know, making a right turn or, or someone else walking down the, walking down the street that would have been a distraction. But I took that moment to really think about, okay, what do I have to work with here? And that's the question I'm always asking myself anytime I'm photographing anything, whether it's on the street, whether it's in a house, in a bar, it doesn't matter. I'm always thinking about what else do I have to play with? And basically, I simplified the shot by tilting the camera down to eliminate some distracting elements, including some cars that were just above uh, the frame line here. So here's a, here's another shot. And here I saw this scene in, the, in people who saw the uh, video that I did for uh, Kelby's um, for Kelby's uh, will have seen this shot and, and what led to this moment, because I saw this scene. And the person that you're seeing there wasn't in the scene initially. I looked at it and I said, wow, look at all that color. Look at that light and shadow, line and shape color. And I knew that it had the potential to make a really great shot. So I quickly moved into that scene. And again, I found my composition. I considered what I wanted to include and what I wanted to exclude. So I was very aware, of not just what was in the center of the frame, but what was at the edges of the frame. I knew I wanted to include those elements of the truck, the marquee, uh, the signs on the top left, uh, the parking cones or whatever things, whatever you call those things. And as I framed the shot, I knew that I needed another element and I needed to get someone in that area where that green fake grass is. So for the longest time, I just stood there as people walked back and forth. And one of the disadvantages I had was that I couldn't see who was coming from the right because of the truck. So just as someone appeared from the right, I had to begin taking pictures. And the hope was I would get something that would complement everything else that was there. And I think I was there for at least 10 or 15 minutes until the light finally changed. And I didn't think I had gotten the shot just because I was just so focused on seeing someone walking into the scene, seeing them in the spot, and then making the picture and not looking at my camera because I didn't know what I would miss. And it, it was only later when I got home and I downloaded the images that I saw that I actually had the perfect subject. I had noticed him with the flowers, but I was so focused on, on timing that uh, I didn't realize how good I had gotten it because the, the red, the yellow, uh, the green, the white of the flowers complements everything else that's in the frame. And this is another shot from uh, that video that I did. And uh, this was a scene where I just stopped at this corner. I always like corners, especially in downtown Los Angeles, because I feel like the scene can give me a lot of line and shape with which to work with. I have the, you know, the lines of the crosswalk. I have the building and I have these nice angles. I have this repetition of pattern throughout um, the light, which was a little, little uh, later on in the afternoon, was coming uh, from the left, from the west. And you can see it on his face here, and you can see that there's some edge light here to the shadow. So I was looking at all of those things and realizing, hmm, I have some potential for something. And this is just a busy street corner. And so I just positioned myself. And as people cross the street and they move past the camera, all of those things, I was just making photographs, not, not just randomly, not just pressing on the shutter release button, burning frames, but really thinking about, okay, what do I want my overall frame to look at, look like? And then as people moved into the scene, I would adjust it very, very slightly. And one of the things I was going for is that I just didn't want to focus 
on a singular subject. What I wanted to do is I wanted to have some interplay. I wanted each person in the frame to be cleanly defined against the backdrop I had found, but have them sort of complement each other. Now, this image isn't completely successful for me, largely because I don't like that U-Haul truck in the back. That white truck just draws, you know, is a, is a big magnet because of its brightness and, and the contrast between the yellow and the orange. But other than that, I still like the scene. And it's one of the reasons I like working on at intersections because I have the opportunity to create compositions that are a little more complex than just one person walking uh, across uh, in front of a wall or a mural. That's really easy to do, and I can do that, you know, like pulling a rabbit out of a hat for me. So I'm always trying to find more complicated images to create. And one of the ways I sort of increase my chances of being able to do that is by finding the setting first, looking at it in terms of line and shape and, you know, what the quality of the light is. And once I've found my composition, it's just a matter of waiting, seeing what plays out in front of me. And yeah, it can take me 5, 10, 15, 20 minutes, maybe even longer to just be there and just be present and just see how things play out. You know, most of the shots I make may not succeed, but I think it's really important for me as a photographer to practice that patience. If I only make one or two shots and then I move on, I'm likely never going to be able to become the kind of photographer I'm, I'm aspiring to be just because my impatience um, leads me to leave a scene prematurely. And here's a shot while I was teaching a workshop in Hollywood. And I saw this, this early morning light cut into this scene where you had these vegetables sitting on these tables on the left and the right. And we've all been to farmer's markets or, or locations like that. And we've all made the close-ups of the vegetables themselves. And I didn't want to do that yet again. I made those shots and they were never really interesting. So I took a step back and said, how can I look at this and not just look at it as a bunch of vegetables on a table? So I took a look and saw what was happening with the light and the shadow. And this hard light in the morning was cutting this really nice shaft of light into the scene here. And it was hitting the vegetables in a way that really brought up their color and their shape and their texture. And because people were moving in and out of these of these stalls, I knew that if I waited long enough, I would probably get somebody walking out of those shadows that might be interesting. So that's exactly what I did. I just stood there in that, in that space, found my frame, and then a variety of people would go in, and I knew they were eventually going to come out, and as they came out into the light, I would make the shot. Sometimes people walked to the left, and they were within the shadow. That didn't help me for anything. So I was just looking for someone walking through the scene and focusing my complete attention on, whoops, sorry about that, focusing my complete attention on the gesture. And in this case, we get the, the feet uh, raising raising up, the leg raising up as they're about to walk through the scene. So for me, this is a very successful shot, largely because it's it takes um, a scene, uh, 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 basically an event, a uh, farmer's market, where we make cliche shots all the time, and I did something different. This is from that same farmer's market, and I was just walking down that, the, that area there, and I saw the relationship between the color of the truck and the, and the tarp on the right-hand side. And then I went, oh, that looks kind of interesting. I saw the color of the wheel, and then I just stopped and I started looking at the scene, and then I noticed that as people walked past, their shadows were being cast on the tarp and on the ground. So I just basically stood there, found my frame, and as people walked into the scene, I got a myriad of shots of people's shadows being cast on the right-hand side. Now, that in and of itself might have been interesting, but I knew I needed something on the left because that area in the lower left-hand quarter of the frame is a lot of negative space. And if I only had that shadow on the right, the image would be imbalanced, even with that yellow tire on the left hand, on the left hand side. So I just stood there almost rigidly and just held on to that composition. And as people came in, 
I would just shoot. But I was keeping an eye not only on the shadow on the right, but the shadows that were coming in from the left. And I made, I don't know how many, 30, 40 shots of this scene, um, just waiting for that convergence of two different elements. And this kind of shot is not easy to do if you're not aware of everything that's happening in your frame. Because by me finding the setting, finding my composition, locking in my frame, and and all the other technical things that I would necessarily have to do in terms of exposure, focus, white balance, all that stuff. All I have to focus on now are the shadows coming into the frame. I don't have to do anything else. And as I see people walking left and right, uh, I can anticipate when they're going to walk into the frame and help complete the shot. So this is in Japan in, in December. I saw this light, this shaft of light coming coming down in this this uh, the square uh, just short of the crosswalk, the famous crosswalk in Shibuya. And I saw this light coming in and there was this guy here on his phone and I just stopped. And I looked at the scene and I go, wow, with this quality of light, I could really do something with this. And I found my spot, posed him within the frame. And what was happening is that a lot of people were moving through the scene. He was sort of a, a fixed element. This is something I talk a lot about in my classes. There are certain elements that are fixed. Those are things that are not going to move for the duration of time that you're there. So the fixed elements are the billboards in the background, of the ground itself, structures, signage, trees, cars, whatever it is. Those things are not going to move. And oftentimes you can find your comp composition by building around those things that are fixed. And then once you've done that, you can start paying attention to the fluid elements. Those elements that are going to be changing from moment to moment. In this case, the fluid elements were, were the people walking around him. The woman with the phone was actually slowly moving forward towards me as she was taking pictures of, you know, the the the, the, uh, the cityscape behind behind us. And then this woman in the shadow to the right is another woman who was just walking towards the intersection. So as I found my frame, he and everything else in the frame was a fixed element, but everything else was moving. So as I stood there, all I had to do was just like stay loyal to my frame. And as those people walked, you know, around the scene, past me, towards me, I was able to slowly just watch for that interplay between subjects so that I would get a nice image that had some, some balance to it. And this is a very busy location. So it, it, it's not easy to, to feel comfortable if you're not used to this, to just being there in place with a camera pointing it towards strangers. But because I was standing there for so long, most people just were completely oblivious to me and they would just walk around me. Um, they assumed that I was there taking pictures of something else, not that. Here's another scene in, in Japan and in, 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 uh, in Tokyo. And I walked down the street and I saw this light uh, through this small alleyway and the way it was illuminating these these posters and these signs and i love that's what drew me into the scene the line and the shadow and i knew that i would need something to help complete the shot but i wasn't worried about that in the instant that i discovered the scene instead i found my composition i knew that it, it, this image really favored and a vertical orientation so i found my camera orientated it ver vertically. I underexposed using my exposure and compensation by two thirds of a stop because I already knew in my mind's eye that I wanted the scene to be underexposed. And as people came walking in from the left to the right, I just waited for them to come into the scene. And then I got lucky and I got this guy with his hat and I knew that the hat would really add a compliment to what I was doing. But I also knew because I had already composed the scene the way I had, that I needed someone whose head or face would be juxtaposed against that last poster where the text was. Because I wanted, I wanted something to complement the faces of the women who were advertising um, whatever they were advertising, a makeup or, or something. But because I, had, I, had, I got drawn into the scene because of the light and shadow, I found my composition. And because I'd done all that heavy lifting, I knew exactly when I would, where I would need someone in order to complete the shot. And luckily I was gifted not only with the perfect subject in terms of the guy with the hat, 
but my timing was right. So I got him just as he crossed uh, across that area in the image there. Now I'm gonna walk you through the whole process here in a series of photographs, which are gonna culminate in the photograph that I think works best for me. And in the previous images, I've just shown you the end result. But this is gonna really show you how I how I process it as, as I'm making the photographs. So I'm, I'm in Tokyo, I'm walking down this really narrow alley where a bunch of bars and restaurants are. And from a distance away, I see the sign for this restaurant. And I see the yellow glow, I see the red tarps, and I just start making a beeline there just because I'm drawn by the light and the color. When I come upon there, I see this I see this basic, this basic scene. And this restaurant here had a line of people that were waiting to sit in here to get to get lunch. Now there were only like six or seven or maybe eight seats at the most, so there was a line extending to the right, just outside of the frame. And as I came here, I saw that the the chefs uh, were behind the window, and there were people coming and uh, placing takeout orders on the left side side of the counter. And there were also people coming in and out of the restaurant. So you can see here, I started looking at the scene thinking, okay, there's, here's my stage. Here, the, there's the window, there's the door, there's the signage. There's, those are basically the fixed elements, right? So I'm finding my frame and I'm thinking, oh, okay, what was happening here? We, we have the guy looking through the window. And I think I, I really would like to have the cook behind the window making a, an appearance in the shot. And then I see this, I see this woman coming out, calling out to the customers who are in the queue um, to say, okay, we have a, a table available, come on in. And I go, oh, if I could get someone coming out of there and the guy in the window, I might have a good shot. So what I do is I start, you know, looking at the frame, making sort of adjustments, right? I'm trying to figure out exactly what my composition needs to be. I make a slight shift here because there's a mirror here, I realize, and I go, maybe I can use the reflection of the mirror as well. Right, you can see that this composition is off kilter. It's not perfect. I'm making this shot because I'm just trying to figure out what my frame is going to be. So I'm shifting a little bit to the left, and there I see. Okay, I can make a use of the reflection. So now I'm thinking, if I can get somebody coming out of the restaurant, if I can get a reflection, and if I can get one of the cooks at the window, I could really have something interesting. And you can see how I'm looking at the fixed elements, but I'm also looking at the potential for fluid elements in the shot. So I'm playing around, getting a sense of exactly where do I need to be. There's the one with the cook, but I don't have the other the other elements. I have no one in the reflection. I have no one coming out of the restaurant. And I, but I'm still shooting, trying to get a sense of what the dynamic is there. You know, I see the guy, you know, the cook getting something to drink. You know, that's interesting. I get the reflection, but the cook disappeared. That's not working. Now the cook's back, but I'm still not getting everything I want. And I, oh. Here, I'm getting a little closer. Now we have a woman about to place an order. We have the cook in the background. We have the reflection. This is more in line with what I'm hoping for, but I don't stop there. I keep shooting, right? Still hunting. That's definitely not going to work because that woman is, his face is, is behind the signage. I'm aware of that sign there, but there's nothing I can really sort of do about it. So I keep shooting. And you can see it's getting a little more getting a little more busy. You can see the cook there. We have different people in the reflection. Oh, now I got that guy coming out of the restaurant, but I don't have the cook, right? And I don't have anything that's really good in terms of the reflection there. But you see that? I kind of knew that was going to happen, but unfortunately not everything else that I wanted to happen occurs, right? But here I'm getting a little closer to that, right? Now I've got the cook in the background. Now I've got someone's reflection. And now I'm just hoping, can I get somebody coming out? And then I'm just shooting. And I'm just waiting for a moment. There's this woman on the right-hand side who's about to come out. She's coming out. And then I get this. This is everything I was hoping for. I get the cook leaning over to his right, my left. I have the woman extending um, some currency onto the other cook in order to pay. I have the guy in the foreground whose reflection can be seen in the mirror, and I have the woman on the right who's, you know, coming out of the restaurant. Bingo. So you can see how I came to the scene, and I didn't know what the heck I was going to photograph. I just saw this light and this color, and I found myself there. 
And then I started looking at all the elements, the fixed and the fluid elements. And I started thinking about, okay, how can I make this work? By focusing first on those fixed elements, I was able to find my composition. And then I could spend the rest of my time paying attention to the fluid ones, what things were changing. And because I saw all this interplay going on, I realized that I didn't have to just settle for one subject. I could probably get two or three or maybe even four. And it was only a, it was only a matter of me just being patient, you know, putting my back, back against the wall and just shooting, 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 not blindly, but with purpose. And this is what I was rewarded with. So you can see how this, 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 this concept is so different from going out and just hunting for photographs where we're just looking for interesting subjects because you likely have all gone out with your camera, batteries charged, full, and you got an empty memory card, and you struggle to find something interesting to photograph. And what I suggest here, what I suggest in my book is that everything is worthy of being photographed. We just have to look at it differently. And rather than going out there with the expectation that, you know, that subjects have to be quote unquote interesting in order for us to photograph it. Instead, I speak to the idea of why don't we look at the world in an interesting way and let the subjects and the scenes and the moments be revealed to us that way. That's why I emphasize so much in the book about looking at what's happening around you in terms of light and shadow, line and shape, color and gesture. Because when you do that, you you separate those objects from their role in your life. You look at a chair, you go, oh, that's meant to be sat in. You see a car, that's meant to be, you know, driven, uh, driven. But if you look at it, you look at it in that literal way, you never think about what it may look like in a photograph. And you make all these prejudgments and you walk past things that could be great photographs, but because you have these preconceptions of what's in, what's worthy of a photograph and what's not, you shut out so much. I am very uh, liberal when it comes to what I can photograph. If it's if it's got great light, texture, shape, color, I'm going to try and make the best photograph I can. Like this guy was just putting out this this tarp here. So for me, the fixed elements were, you know, the the lanterns, the signage, the you know, all those physical materials. The one thing that was fluid was him, and so I could find the composition. And as he moved his hands up and down to secure that on the awning, I just I just paid attention to what was happening with his hands. That's it. You know, his arms and his hands were really going to be the crux of the success of the image for me, because everything else that you see in the frame, that wasn't going to change. The, the tart might change position a little bit as he physically secured it to the awning. But all I really needed to focus on was just him and his hands. And I got an image that I think, uh, you know, was really interesting. Now, here's a shot that happened with moments. We were waiting for a taxi. I'd seen this scene and I went, mm, this is really kind of interesting in terms of all the lines and shapes, but there wasn't anything particularly interesting happening there. I kind of looked through the viewfinder and go, oh, okay, but there was nothing really there. And then we're still waiting for the cab and all of a sudden I see all these women and this girl coming into the scene and I quickly whip around and I think I shot like three frames of these of these people moving through this moving through this corner. And I really love this shot, you know, because of the interplay between the umbrellas, the the, the woman's gesture, her body language as he moves through the scene in the middle of the frame, the woman coming from the left. And I also love all this line and shape and color that's happening here. I mean, I couldn't have planned this shot any better, but I think the reason I was able to react as quickly as I did and get this shot and not lose it because of a bad exposure or focus or timing was because I had already observed it even before the moment presented itself. Anytime I'm walking around, I'm always looking for scenes, for stages where I could possibly produce a really interesting photograph. And sometimes that moment has not even presented itself. It's not even happened yet. But I look at it and go, oh, this might be an interesting place for something to happen. And then I'm just going to just observe it. If I'm in no rush to get anywhere, I'll just take a look. 
And then I'll observe what foot traffic is happening. I'll go, oh, yeah, yeah, something could really play off, just like the scene that I just showed you. Now, here I'm in a train. We were coming back from another town in Tokyo. And this is one of my students from, from the workshop. And as the, as the other trains whiz by, I see that the colors of the train uh, could be really interesting if they were shot at a relatively slow shutter speed. So in this case, his hand was on the window for a very long time. So the frame of the window, his hand, the seat in front of me, again, fixed element. And I noticed that any time a train would come by, he would turn his head so that I could see his reflection in the glass. So I just, I just waited. I just waited for another train to come by. And when the train came by, I purposely used a relatively slow shutter speed in order to get some blur so I could get that that streaking. So you can see that I don't have to be out in the street in order to make you know, make an interesting photograph. I could be on a train. I could be anywhere. But by just choosing to look at what's in front of me in a different way, I can make interesting photographs. I don't I don't have to be obligated to go on vacation to you know drive 30 miles to some destination to go to some sort of public event with the hope of getting a photograph. I can look at my everyday world. And if I'm looking at it in that in this different way, I can make a remarkable shot. Now, I again, I was all the way across this parking lot. I saw this light, and I started moving in that direction. And as soon as I got there, there's this guy on the right hand side who was stretching, a low term, you know, leaning his back. And there's this guy over left on the phone. Right? So like I see those guys, but I'm also taking a look at everything else in the frame. The light, the shadow, the line, the shape, the color. And at some point, once I get into position, I find my frame, and then it's just about shooting, but observing the body language of the two, waiting for, for a body language between the two to complement each other. And you can see that regardless of how you come to a scene, what you basically are trying to do is try to parse most of the stuff. You're trying to get as much out of the way as possible so you can focus on the things that are really going to be important to your photograph. Because if you're just going, you see an interesting character, you raise the camera your eye, and you take a picture, you're really not seeing. You know, you're just you're just a monkey pressing a button, hoping that something turns out. What I'm encouraging you to do is being more thoughtful about how you look through the camera and the choices you make in terms of what you choose to include and exclude from the frame. When you look at the photographs of great photographers, that's what they're doing. You know, they're not just seeing, they're not just looking, they're seeing. They're making choices, a series of choices in order to get to a shot. Like uh, on a train, right? I see uh, this person uh, shooting through the window and I see his wife, you know, pointing at camera as well. And I'm just sitting there trying to get from point A to point B. But I see this subframing, this frame within a frame. I see the gesture of him you know, with his phone, and I see her hand come out. Really simple, you know, but I, I see the potential of that, of, of that moment, and then I just make, make the shot, because basically the stage has been set for me. Now all I have to do is pay attention to the small details, like the, the finger that has that little separation between his uh, phone and his finger. That little detail means a lot to me. All right. Hi everyone, sorry about that. We're not quite sure what happened to his sound there that it just kind of went out. Um, the good news is there are no technical glitches when you have the book in front of you, which unfortunately there are <laughs> some glitches when we try to do this webinar. Um, I'm seeing from a few of you that you're getting an error on our website when you try to purchase the book, and we're looking into that right now. We're not sure why that's happening either. It just does not seem like a good day for technology. So hopefully that should clear up uh, within the next few minutes here. And then also I just want to remind you that you will get that code in your email tomorrow that will come with the replay. So that coupon code, that's not, um, that's not going to expire when this, when this webinar ends. There we go. Yeah. Now we can go the next. Yeah. There you are. I don't know what happened. Your sound just kind of cut out in the middle of your sentence. All right. Um, okay. Just let me just, uh, talk about this last image and then we'll, we'll, um, and then we can take some questions. Do we have any questions? We have one question so far. So if anyone else has any questions they would like to submit, go ahead and submit them now, and we will get to those in the next couple minutes. Okay. 
I'm sorry about all the technical issues, but um, all right. So here's a scene in Tokyo, and I just wanted to use a relatively slow shutter speed. I wanted to do something different. So I saw this scene, and basically I rested my camera on this rail on the opposite side of the street. And again, I just found my uh, composition, and then I chose a relatively shutter, slow shutter speed. I can't remember exactly what it was, maybe like a 15th of a second, maybe an eighth. And then as people move through the scene, I kind of anticipated where I would want people. I knew I would want somebody here against this white wall because this was an area of negative space and that I would want someone around here. And so as people move through the scene, that's what I did. I just made um, different photographs there. Again, you know, you can see, uh, and I'll just quickly walk through these images here so you can see them, how, how paying attention to setting first and not necessarily looking for an interesting subject sort of sets the literally sets the stage for a really interesting photograph. And if you look at the world basically as a stage, you can just see so much that you never would have seen before. And you can make some just wonderful photographs by just going, okay, what's happening with light and shadow, line and shape in the scene? Let me observe foot traffic as, as it's moving through here and figure out maybe, maybe there has the potential of making a really interesting, interesting shot. So. Um, that's but does uh, anybody have any questions at all? We do have a couple questions I can start you with. Um, Glenn asks, how do you handle privacy concerns when doing street photography? Do you encounter people being upset with you for taking their photos? Uh, very rarely. Um, you know, I'm, because of the way that I shoot, I'm usually already present there with the camera. So people, as they start walking towards me, they already see me making photographs and they're not thinking that I'm including them in my, my shot. Um, you know, I don't really get that sort of issue at all. And in terms of, you know, uh, people getting angry at me, it's, it's, I've been shooting on the street for pretty much all my life, 40 years. So, um, I've never, I've, I've got more people get more irritated at me if they're security guards, uh, because they tell me I can't photograph here. But n never really from people who, who, who see me and think I've made the photograph. Most people don't care, and they just keep moving. Uh, and someone asked, how, how would you define or label your style? And do you ever shoot in black and white? Oh, I shoot black and white all the time. I mean, I shoot color, and I convert certain images to black and white. If you follow me on Instagram, which is at ebodyandx, uh, you'll see um, the, pretty much all my, my current work. And uh, yeah, I also, I'll convert an image to black and white if I think that it's going to be better served uh, as a black and white. But I think the great majority of the photographs that I do post and share are in, are in color. Okay. How do you personally apply your composition technique to your portrait shots? Oh, um, that's something I'm increasingly trying to do. Um, so when I'm making a portrait, I'm increasingly trying to um, make more environmental portraits. So I'm thinking about the setting. Where am I going to place the subject? Because I don't, I don't particularly. I'm not really interested in doing a, a portrait just against a clean white background. I would really, really like to find an interesting setting like the ones I've shown you here, and then place a subject in that space. Uh, I think it, it, it can result in a really interesting photograph. It's more envir environmental portraiture uh, than anything else, but. Uh, uh, I have to do that more because I, I don't think I've got locked it down yet. Do you, uh, so like you had said about, sorry, I'm not sure why I'm echoing right now. Um, you, you had said that people tend to see you with, uh, you know, your camera out and so they know you're already taking photos. So do you notice, do some people purposefully try to avoid being caught in your frame? Do they stop to wait for you to take the photo? And then conversely, like, how do you feel about that? Are you waiting sometimes for someone to enter the shot? Um, because I use a small camera, I use the Fuji X100F, I've been using that series of camera for five or six years, so most people don't see that as a real camera, uh, so that helps. And then, you know, when I have my camera in my hand, I'm always sort of doing this, you know, looking at it. So when people are coming in, in my space and I know that I want them in the frame and I don't want them walking around me, I'll, like, get look down at my camera, but I'm looking at them from the corner of my eye, and once they start you know, moving in the direction I want, I'll just raise the camera and I'll just keep shooting. And they'll walk past and they may look 
at me, and I may see them out of the corner of my eye, but I'm not making eye contact. I still act as if I'm focused on something over there. You know, I'm casting people, you know, from 100 feet away. Going, oh, that person's wearing a red coat. They would really be good for this frame. And so as other people are walking past, I'm still doing shooting, but I'm looking at them going, okay, when are they going to be in the spot that I need them to be? And then click. So we don't have any other questions. I just want to ask you if there's anything else about the book that you'd like to mention to everyone who's still here. Yeah, I think that that the um, the the whole idea behind the book is is really to teach people a different way of seeing. And I think that the way I've spelled it out there gives you basically a sort of a step-by-step -step of how to do it, how to sort of take a step back from the way that you've been seeing the world and, uh, and reconsidering um, the way you've been photographing. And I think that sort of taking a step back and restarting uh, is always a good thing, but having a structure behind it is even better. And I think the book provides that. Great. And one last question, is there anything you have coming up that you'd like to promote or mention to everyone who's here? Yeah, a couple of things. Um, with my podcast, I'm going to have our 500th episode in about a couple of weeks. And if people are not familiar with the show, they can go to thecandidframe.com and uh, subscribe to the show. It's free. And you can listen to it on whatever apps that uh, you listen to podcasts on. And I'm going to be teaching uh, several street photography workshops. I'm going to have another one in Japan next December, or this December. And uh, in, in next month, I'm going to have a half-day workshop in Hollywood, California, um, in uh, the first week in February. I think it's on February 3rd. But you can go to the website to find out more about that. Great. Thank you so much for joining us today. And to everyone who tuned in, tomorrow you'll get a replay link, and you will also get the... Um, excuse me, coupon code to purchase that book. So that's it for today. Thank you so much, Iberian X, for joining us, and thank you, everyone else. All right, thanks, guys. Bye.